Joining us for a CNBC exclusive to discuss the company's results, take two CEO Strauss Zelnick, also, of course, currently the interim chairman of CBS. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. All right, uh, I'll share. We don't usually, but off break, you're a little frustrated with the performance of the stock because you think, hey, we beat the number and we didn't give particularly bad guidance. Although I'm seeing some Wall Street analysts say, well, they didn't like the guidance, particularly weakness, they say, in red debt to redemption. So we crushed the quarter. We had great results across the board, and we issued an outlook for the full year that says we'll have a record year in terms of net bookings and cash flow provided by operations. We sold 23 million units of Red Dead Redemption. It's a massive hit. We're having another record year for NBA 2K19. Uh, everything is firing across all cylinders, including NBA 2K Online in China, which now has 43 million registered users. Recurrent consumer spending on the title was up more than double in the quarter. So it's, it, just, it really is great news across the board. Having crushed the third quarter, we adjusted our expectations for the fourth quarter to reflect a, a record year. And, it, and the fourth quarter implicit guidance, therefore, is less than consensus. Right. Uh, the quarter's total bookings beat was relatively modest, says Goldman Sachs, compared to the magnitude of the RCS beat. They go on to say as well that there were headwinds from Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, the enormous tailwinds. Right? Enormous we, we, tailwinds. So we, they got it wrong. In that instance, totally wrong. We've uh, shipped vastly more than our expectation. The outlook is great. I mean, but if you look at the EA, I mean, they cut their revenue guidance. I know it's a completely different company, but the market appears to be telling a story of challenging gaming environment right now and taking down all the multiples. Why is that? We don't see it at all. At the end of the day, entertainment businesses are driven entirely by the release schedule, and all of our releases are working really well. So uh, it, I don't like to argue with the market. Market conditions are market conditions. At the end of the day, if we deliver, we do well. If we fail to deliver, we don't. We are not seeing any competitive headwinds at all as long as we deliver great quality. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a 97 Metacritic score, tied Grand Theft Auto 5, and all of our products are performing. NBA 2K19 is set to achieve another record this year. We, uh, a couple of weeks ago, got this warning from NVIDIA, though, that also perhaps concerned people because they talked about selling fewer chips into China, particularly for gaming. You're not seeing weakness in China? No, not at all. The approvals have opened up again in China. Uh, Asia is a really important growth area for us, and we're gratified that approvals are starting up again. And as I said, NBA 2K Online in China, which is the number one PC sports title, which is our title in, in a partnership with Tencent, just had its, saw its uh, revenue double in the quarter. The narrative seems to be, though, that just everybody's playing Fortnite and they're not playing anything else. I mean, is that, is, A, I, I know it's not true. No, it's not remotely But is true. it frustrating for you? And, and what, when you hear that, is your response? Well, Fortnite was a huge hit last year. That's great. Um, you know, we, we admire the work done by others. We'd like to have all the hits. We don't always get all the hits. At the same time that Fortnite was doing well, Grand Theft Auto Online had another record year. And Red Dead Redemption 2 has sold in over 23 million units at the same time that other titles are in the marketplace doing well. In the entertainment business, we don't, we're not picking and choosing among competitors. It's not like going to a grocery store. Uh, in the entertainment business, you only select what you really want. If there's nothing that you want, you buy nothing. If there's a lot that you love and want, you'll typically buy all of it. As long as we deliver quality, people show up. And that's what we've seen in this quarter, and that's what we're projecting in the year. But the Fortnite effect isn't just a competition for eyeballs. Isn't it also this idea that it's free to play, and that could actually be a headwind to some of the models if consumers get used to that idea? Well, there's a big free-to-play market out there. So free-to-play is about a $60 billion business. It's been around before Fortnite. Fortnite is a, a very robust title for a free-to-play environment. And that speaks to a hit that, that exists and a business model related to that hit. I'm not sure you can extend it to the, the rest of the market. Uh, when, when we put out a, a high-quality title like an NBA or Red Dead Redemption 2 or Grand Theft Auto 5 or other titles, Civilization, uh, many other titles that we bring to market, as long as we deliver something great, consumers will show up and they'll pay for the title. And then we seek to engage with them after the release, and we can usually monetize that engagement as well. Which is, you know, our recurrent consumer spending was up 31% in the quarter, which was not our expectation. Again, that beat our expectation. Um, a, a lot of questions, at least, around the idea as well of subscription models. 
Uh, I know you were asked on the call about it. Uh, you know, what is your view when it comes to sort of what may be the proliferation of these types of models when it comes to, to playing video games? Well, I know subscription's a holy grail for many entertainment executives. I would just observe that the average American household wants somewhere between two and three subscriptions and no more. So I think a subscription model works when your subscription offering benefits consumers and when it works for the creators of the product as well. You have to find that crossover. Uh, I think that may be somewhat challenging in the video game business, given the cost to create the programming and the fact that an avid video game player plays about 45 hours a month versus about 150 hours of television viewing. And within those 45 hours, you're probably only playing one, two, three titles. So I'm not sure you need a robust subscription offering. If you do, if that's what consumers want, we'll show up, we'll be there for consumers. But I am a little skeptical that that'll be the, the winning strategy. I mean, specifically the players that are thought to be entering this space, Google, for instance, in terms of offering a streaming platform to coincide with 5G, Apple reportedly is working on, on a gaming sub sort of subscription service. Who are the winners and the losers going to be, and how do you deal with giants like that, which, with, which have so much capital entering your space? Well, streaming is obviously a distribution technology. Subscription is a business model. So they might go together, but they need to go together. Streaming is going to be a great thing for our business, because broader distribution is always a good thing. And if streaming does open the market to more consumers, they will come for so our products. you see them as a partner? Absolutely. And there are only a limited number of companies that can offer streaming technology, and it's not ready for prime time yet. I am a believer it'll come to market, and I think that will broaden our market uh, very significantly. And most people do. But I think that's a great opportunity. I mean, they're all in this. Microsoft with Xbox and, right. and Amazon with Twitch. Is this just going to be battle of the titans? Well, you have, in order to be a streaming player, you, you need to have terrific technology. You also need to have hyperscale data centers all around the world. There are only several companies that have that. So can Google and Amazon, Facebook and Microsoft do it? Yeah. Can anyone else do it? Pretty hard. From our point of view, it's sort of the same thing as saying, how do we feel about Comcast you know, and cable? And the answer is, we feel just fine. You know, in order for, do we work with Comcast on their cable? You bet we do. Are we happy to do that? Yes. Does the business model make sense for us? Of course it does. Um, Stress, just coming back to today's performance overall, and you seem somewhat mystified. Uh, I, I, what are we missing here then? Or what are you missing in terms of investors seem to be running away from your sector right now? Maybe it's largely because of EA, but there does seem to be some idea that either these stocks are overpriced given the growth prospects, or, or they're not simply coming in in terms of meeting those expectations. Well, we know the big market moves typically are related to a, a disappointment or a change in expectations or both. And so I think it's possible that some people thought that if you were in this business, that is to say the interactive entertainment business, if you were front and center, things were just going to be fantastic all the time. And I, I actually resisted that notion, even when it was benefiting us. I mean, I basically said, look, we rise or fall based on the quality of our products. As it happens, that has been a great story for Take Two. We have the highest Metacritic scores in the business. All of our products are working, and they have for a number of years. So when we have something that doesn't work, we take responsibility for it. Our entire focus is on quality, efficiency, creativity, and encouraging the best creative people in the business to pursue their passions. That yields a great result. That does not turn into a business that we show up every day and it just keeps clicking along by itself. That's not the nature of the business. And I think some investors may have thought that was the case about the sector. It's not the case about the sector. You've got to show up every day and work hard and deliver. Well, the stock's come back a couple of percent since we started talking. Speaking broadly about media, you have a lot of responsibilities that include being the interim chairman of CBS, which is in the midst, at least it appears, of looking for a new CEO. Is that search underway? Are you getting anywhere in terms of finding somebody to take that place? It's underway. That's been previously reported. That's all you got to share for me? <laughs> That's pretty much the big news. And is the interim designation for you one that you are looking forward to eliminating in the sense of no longer having that title at all? Because I would imagine you've got a lot of work that faces you every single day, not just here, but given the responsibilities of being chairman of CBS. Uh, you know, it's interim for a reason, and that means it will come to an end. And in the meantime, I'm trying to be as helpful as I can be. How are you helpful? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask other people. But I think, I think for, uh, for a non-executive chairman, your goal is to convene and uh, be a sounding board and you know, help, help things move along. But what don't you do? You don't operate the company. 
Uh, and finally, of course, I know you're no stranger to the speculation that continues that at some point CBS and Viacom are going to uh, get back together in some fashion or at least talk. Are there any talks underway at this point about a potential merger? So I remember that part about I'm not an operating executive, probably, uh, probably not something well, I would want to chat about. As not executive chairman, <laughs> I know you'd be aware of that since you do run the board. But. Yeah. We're, you know, we're, we're thrilled of how the comp at how the company is doing. The company is performing just great, and, I, and I'm happy to be on the board and hope to be of service. And do you expect to have a CEO in place in the fairly soon? Uh, yeah, fairly I think that's term? right. You do? Yeah. Fairly Relatively term. soon. Which would be what? A couple of months? Hard to say. Hard to say. But we're working on it's in progress.